Romans chapter 10 starts out with this. It says, Dear brothers and sisters, and I'm reading in the New Living Translation as you follow. Dear brothers and sisters, the longing of my heart and my prayer to God is for the people of Israel to be saved. He said, the, des the prayer, the longing in his heart and the prayer is for Israel to be saved. Now, Israel is the chosen people, right? Israel right. is the chosen, he's the chosen one. They're the chosen ones, right? Right. So why would there be a challenge with their salvation? If they're the chosen ones, you would assume that they, they have favor and grace and the rights uh, and the abilities because uh, they're in relationship with God to, to have all of the benefits, right? Look at what he says. He says, I know what enthusiasm they have for God but it is misdirected zeal for they don't understand God's way of making people right with himself, refusing to accept God's way. They cling to their own way of getting right with God by trying to keep the law. And so <laughs> this reminds me of what I see in the church many times. We, we get to a point where we get into our traditions, we get into the things that we've learned and the things that we know, and we rely more on that in reference to be a guide to salvation than what God actually said. We, we, we rely on the law, the, the Ten Commandments, or the rules of right and wrong as our foundation for judging whether or not we're accepted by God. And this makes it clear that that's not the way. That's following after the, the ways of the... the it, it's following the ways of um, the children of Israel. Could it be that we, in some way, based on our learning, we put ourselves in a position where we're doing the same things that God is talking about right here, in some cases. Trying to keep the law. Keep that in mind. It says, for Christ has already accomplished the purpose for which the law was given. As a result, all who believe in him are made right with God. So, I don't want to get ahead of myself. Let me keep going. It says, salvation is for everyone. For Moses writes that the law's way of making a person right with God requires obedience to all of his commands. But faith's way of getting right with God says, don't say in your heart who will go up to heaven to bring Christ down to earth. And don't say who will go down to the place of the dead and bring Christ back to life again. In fact, it says the message is very close at hand. It is on your lips and in your heart. And that message is the very message about faith that we preach. So I want to stop there for a minute and just, and just reflect for a second. So he's talking about salvation, right? He says the answer, in, in a sense, the answer to the message is close at hand. It's on your lips. Salvation says you confess with your mouth, right? He says it's in your heart. He says you believe in your heart. He said, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, then you are saved, right? Right. Based on that confession. Based on that, the confession of your heart and the belief in your heart. I mean, confession with your mouth and belief in your heart. He said that message is about faith, and that's what we preach. So why was it important for him to make the differentiation about God's way of making us right with him versus 
Moses' way of making us right with him. And why is he referring to the children of Israel in this particular passage of scripture? Because the children of Israel also represents something particular as well. Can you help me out a little bit? Unbelief. Say that again. Unbelief. Unbelief. Uh -huh. Well, I think that they were still trying to be justified by the law. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he makes it clear. So what is the, who does the children of Israel represent? Anybody want to take a stab at that? The non-believers? Ain't the Not children the, of Israel supposed to be us? The children of Israel represents the favorite of God. They represent the ones who were supposed to be in a position of favor and grace that God had chosen. And because of that, um, there is a thought process that because they're favored, that there are certain things that they don't have to do. Donnell, go ahead, if you will. Uh, you went ahead and uh, uh, pretty much uh, said it. We are like children of God. Right. So it's important that we don't miss the, the, the parabolic uh, the 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 symbolism that, that God that's in God's word as well as we go through. So that's why I'm taking time to make sure that we realize that the children of Israel represents the favorite of God. And so once we confess Jesus Christ as our Lord, guess what happens? We become the favorite of God. And so that means that this applies to us as well. This is telling us that we need to be careful that we don't get so caught up in, in biblical principles, in biblical rules, that we put ourselves back under subjection to what Jesus has already paid the price to free us from. And we, we talked about that in previous chapters as well. But I think that it's being brought out again in just a slightly different way. And I want to make sure that I call attention to it as we go forward. So he's he's craftily telling us, he basically just told us in, in verse 8 um, what we need to do to be saved. But he did it in a sneaky way. He said the message is, uh, is very close at hand. It's on your lips. So most people who think that they have a whole lot of stuff to do in order to be saved don't realize salvation is close. It's on your very lips. It's in your heart. That's what he's saying. And I thought that was kind of cool to kind of look at that and say, oh, he snuck that in on us. He snuck that in on us to let us know that what we're striving to get from God is so close to us that it really is not impossible for us to reach let's go let's move forward you know and and, and that uh, excuse the all, all the background I'm, I'm still like traveling but but uh i i think that's so awesome how paul writes you know the contrast that he makes is like you know you you can travel for miles and miles into the deep into the ocean into all the corners of the world and yet, the, the, the salvation is right here at your mouth and right in your heart. And you've been looking all over. For, you, know, you know, I don't know if you've read that story about acres in your own backyard or, or uh, acres of diamonds, you know, where people will go millions of miles or, or a whole bunch of miles trying to find something that is right there in their own backyard. And yep. it's like Paul was saying, you know, why you think you got to ascend uh, to the deep or, or uh, to the heavens or go way down in the deep? It's like you guys are, are seeking all these other ways uh, of, of finding um, salvation. And it's like, it's right here at your own mouth and in your heart. If right. you just confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you know, it's, it's just amazing that contrast. I'm glad you right. brought that out. I'm glad you brought that out. No, it's awesome. It's awesome. 
Um, and, and, and I think that the simplicity of it is what, what makes us um, question it. it. It can't be that easy. You know what I'm saying? Go ahead, Donnell. And um, is and the one phrase, the power. What is what is it again? Uh, the power of life and death lies between the tongue. Yeah. Life and death is in the power of the tongue, and those that uh love it eat the fruit thereof. Absolutely, absolutely right. Verse nine says, if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's it. But here's the thing that people don't get. If you're in a situation where you're at a church and the service was great and you're feeling emotional and you're feeling pulled into uh, because you desire for something different, so much you feel pulled into um confessing jesus christ as lord because you want the end result but you don't necessarily know what it's going to take to actually walk the walk you you could be in a situation where you confess jesus christ as your lord and savior and don't even really understand that you don't believe it in your heart you don't find out you don't believe it in your heart until the first challenge comes and you're back to what you were doing before. The way you really know that things start to make a difference to you is when you get into the same situation that you've been in before, but because of the confession that you made, because of what you desire to get from God means something to you now, it causes you to question the decision that you would ordinarily make, and it guides you in many cases to ponder, to question, to get some advice about what you should do because you just don't want to rely on or do what is status quo anymore. And that is an indication that now there is something working on the inside of you that is supposed to cause a change. It's causing a change because the thing that you did not think about before, you now think about. So now what you do matters to you. And that's the beginning of your walk with Christ. And so that is something that, that I love about understanding, uh, developing a relationship with him. Verse 10 says, for it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God. And it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. So what happens first, the confession or the belief? What happens first? You know, what, what comes first, the chicken or the egg? The belief. The belief comes first. <clears throat> Believing in your heart is what makes you right with God. So notice believing in your heart is what gains you your righteousness. But because you've gained your righteousness does not mean that you've gotten your salvation. Because it says in the next line, and by openly declaring your faith, you are saved. So you could have people that believe in their heart that, that God is real and God has made them right, but they still haven't gained their salvation if they haven't made the confession. I think in one of the chapters that we read, it says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, right? See, that scripture comes to mind when I'm talking about this because that means that if I really made the confession and if I really believe it, there's a boldness that's going to come about. I'm not going to be ashamed to say that I believe in, in what God is. And so openly declaring that it's not for anybody else. It's really for you. It's you staking your claim on what God has promised you. Amen. It says, as the scripture tells us, anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Now, <laughs> I, I struggle with this one a little bit because for so long, I was worried. I was worried as if I was going to measure up. I was worried if, 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 if I was worthy of what I heard him telling me that I was supposed to do. And I know I'm not the only one. Has, has anybody else been worried about, you know, how they look? to other people based on the call on their life? Anybody? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. 
So this scripture was talking exactly. directly to me. And I said, wow, anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. So what is the trust in him? The trust in him is the trust in the purpose and plan that he's called for you. It's the trust in him that, you know, no matter what people are saying about you and how they're trying to drag your name in the mud, that he is a redeemer and a restorer. And he is, he is the one that ultimately is going to cause your story to be told in the way that it needs to. And that way we don't get caught up in the tests and trials that we go through along the way. We don't get shamed and we shouldn't be shamed, especially around our brothers and sisters. This scripture tells me, verse 11 tells me that if you as an individual believes in God and God says you will never be disgraced, then I need to make sure I'm not doing anything to make you feel or seem disgraced. Wouldn't you agree that that's kind of a principle that's underlying in the word? And if I make somebody feel lowly or down or disgraced based on something that's happened or something that they've done, I'm working against the word of God based on what that scripture says. Would you agree with that? So that means that as a leader, and as a teacher, I need to be mindful of, of the condition of how I encourage, uplift, support, and even tell the truth to, even when it's stuff that you don't want to hear. I need to be wary, uh, not worried, but wary as, as far as being aware of how I go about doing things because I don't want to put you in a position that God says you will not, never be in. It's not my job to build, take, tear you down. It's my, my, my job to lift you up. And so that in itself, in, in reference to how we do ministry, is a guideline. And so now I have to say, if I'm doing something that makes somebody feel disgraced or ashamed, I need to change. This is something that will cause me to change my behavior because I wouldn't want to line up with what God says. And as leaders in the church and as members of the church, we also have to be mindful that when more people come in and they don't look like us, they don't talk like us, they don't act like us, they don't understand what we understand, our job is not to tear them down and make them feel disgraced in being in the presence of, of the word of God and the spirit of God and people who are supposed to have the spirit of God within them. They should not be ashamed or disgraced. They should feel welcome and loved. So once again, Romans is teaching us more than just what it says. It's showing us principles of how we need to act moving forward as well. The word is our guideline. It says the Jews and the Gentiles are the same in this respect. They have the same Lord who gives generously to all who call on him. Now, we talked about the children of Israel, but now he's also bringing in the Gentiles. And the Gentiles were the people who did not, were not the favorite of God. So now he's saying, you looked at the children of Israel, you looked at the Jewish population, the ones that were called and favored, the ones that God bent over backwards to do miracles for. The ones, when we think of them, we think of the favorite of God and everything that God has done and how God has shown up in their life. And then we look at ourselves and say, but we weren't part of that story. We weren't part of that call. We weren't part of that group. But God is say, saying to us through his word that Jews and Gentiles are the same in this respect. That they have the same Lord who gives generously to all who call upon him. So that means that as a Gentile is not one of the favored ones. If I, call, if I do the same thing that the word says, I get the same benefits and the same results. God is no respecter of persons. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen. It says, but how can they call on him to, to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless somebody tells them? This, this verse of scripture, the King James Version would, would say, how can, they, uh, how can they be saved unless, uh, unless they believe? How can they believe unless they are taught and how can they be taught unless some uh unless they are preached to or something like that it's it's a different variation but i like this better because all of us are the royal priesthood and all of us have the opportunity 
to minister and encourage people in his word. Amen. And so because of that, that means that all of us have some level of accountability. All of us may not be preachers, but all of us can testify of the goodness of the Lord in our personal lives. So we all play a part in how people hear about him. So how can they be saved unless they believe in him? Well, nobody's going to believe in him unless they see something. That's why Jesus uh, pro uh, produced and God produced miracles in the Old Testament. He did it because people needed to see something in order for them to come together and believe. So how can they believe on him uh, unless, uh, how can they call on him unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they ha have never heard of him? And so the hearing of him, so think about, think about it this way. If God did a miracle in your life today, what would you do? You probably tell everybody you know about it, right? You would shout to the rafters about how good God is because of what he did for you. God used that same tactic. He used that same tactic of advertisement to say, I'm going to produce a miracle because I know that's going to cause the word to spread. And it's going to cause people who are in need to come and to try to find out what they need to do in order to get that miracle to happen for them as well. And so how can they hear unless someone tells them? That's what we're here to do. We're here to testify and we're here to share the word. I'm here to teach. I'm here to guide. I'm here to make sure your questions get answered so that you don't have a challenge in believing. Amen. It says, and how can anyone, oh, go ahead, Donnell. Question about the salvation and everything like that, right? Uh -huh. uh, you have a lot of, uh, you have a lot of uh, apostles or bishops that say you have to have that water baptism along with the uh, forgiveness uh, for uh, accepting Jesus. You have to have that water baptism. What do you think about that? I, I don't think it lines up with what the word just said. The word says, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you're saved. It says nothing about baptism. It says nothing about uh, anything else. It doesn't say that you have to go to church every Sunday. It doesn't say any, it doesn't give you any other prerequisites. It says, confess, confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. And then it, it, and then it reversed it. It said, in order to obtain righteousness, you have to believe in him, right? And then your faith causes you to, to make the confession. So the bottom line is, I don't care what anybody else says. If they're adding anything else to confessing with your mouth and believing in your heart, they're now creating doctrine. And that's the problem. And, we, and have to, we have to stick with what the word says and not try to try to pretty it up or doctor it up for our own purposes. Go ahead, uh, Pastor Shelby. You know, and there's another uh, illustration or example that we uh, we use a lot as far as uh, baptism uh, to, to approve the point that baptism is not required for salvation and, and the um, case in point scripturally is the thief on the cross where of course he didn't have time of course to be baptized but yet when he said lord remember me when you come into your kingdom jesus said this day you shall be with me in paradise well of course the thief didn't get baptized and he didn't say well since you can't get baptized you ain't gonna be able to be with me you know so watch this that, i'm glad you said that i'm glad you said that i want you to come back no, no, you cut me off, man. I, that, that's it. I don't appreciate that. <laughs> no. off of that. I don't. I don't. I. I. I was flowing, and you cut me off. No, I, I'm. I'm messing with you, man. I just want to make that that scripture reference. No, no, no. You. That's the perfect scripture reference because what happened? What did? What did the thief do? The thief made a confession. He confessed that Jesus was Lord. Exactly. And God judged him that he believed it in his heart. That's right. That's exactly what happened. <laughs> you say it's a perfect example, right? That is, yeah. that is the perfect example. That's why I, yeah. I, I didn't want to. I didn't want to get too far. I wanted to make sure that I emphasize that point. Go ahead, Donnell. Because uh, the reason why is like I, when you look at Acts uh, two thirty eight, right? It uh -huh. says Peter replied, and you know he said, "Repent and be baptized." He said, "Every one of you, in the uh -huh. name of Jesus Christ." For the forgiveness of your sins and i know uh it, and it, it goes on and talks about receiving the gift of the holy ghost right 
So with baptism. So what he was doing at that point was he was guiding them because these mo most of these people had walked with Jesus Christ, had known about and seen the miracles that, that God had performed. These weren't novices. These weren't people who did not have a uh, did not have an understanding. These were people who had some grounding and had, who walked with Jesus. So when he told them to be baptized, when we understand through salvation that one of the evidences of salvation is the gift of speaking in other tongues, right? If we go all the way back to when Jesus was being baptized by John, when Jesus was being baptized by John, they said that, uh, they indicated that there were angels looking down when he was baptized, right? And that there was something that happened in that baptism. So there was an awakening or there was something that happened when Jesus was baptized. And so the baptism, because earlier in this, earlier in the book of Romans, it talks about uh, things like baptism and it talks about things like circumcision, that those things are no longer a requirement based on the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So the gift of the Holy Spirit that is granted to you through salvation is a gift that you have to receive. He was guiding them to receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit at that time. So he was calling the Holy Spirit to come down and for them to be baptized. And because they walked with Jesus and understood the word on a level that maybe other people did not, the people that were in that room were true believers. That is why the Holy Spirit was allowed to come down because they were seeking after and desiring to get closer to Jesus Christ based on the loss that they had experienced. So I think the reference that he's giving in reference to uh, being uh, being baptized was not a command um, of salvation, but it was a command of invitation for them to participate in having the spirit indwell in them and to be able to speak in other tongues based on the praise and worship that they had been doing at that time um, and the belief that they had already had. Jesus had already told them that when he left that there was someone that was coming after him and that, that was the Holy Spirit. And so it, he was introducing the Holy Spirit to them and telling them to receive it at that time. <clears throat> So question about the baptism since we're discussing it. Uh-huh. Isn't it more symbolic um, indicating a change that you go in one way and as you're coming out, you should be changed, you should be different. So isn't it more a, of a, um, a public acknowledgement that you're accepting and making the change? It's, it's no different than communion. It's no different than any of the other things that Jesus did that we now do in remembrance of him. We do it as reverence to him, not because it holds any power over us as far as salvation, but it is an indication. And think about it. It is an outward gesture showing what our faith is. Because if Jesus was baptized and I decide to be baptized, then I am saying I am walking the path that God laid out for me. If, uh, if I say that I want to speak in other tongues because Jesus said that that was a gift for me, that is an acknowledgement by me saying that I want to be more closer to him. I want to receive the gifts that he told me that I, that I could have. And now I'm seeking out those specific things so that they can be a part of my faith life in a part of what I do in reference to representing Jesus Christ in, in a really powerful way. It's just saying, I believe in everything that he did. If we get together and we break bread like they did at, at the Last Supper, we're doing that because it is in reference to what God said about fellowship and us coming together. You know what I'm saying? Everything that we do is symbolic of, and I think that's where we get messed up at. We substitute the symbolicness of the things that we do 
and we change it to make it seem like that is doctrinal of what we have to do to be accepted by him which with 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 and he's indicating to us that that is not the case he wants us to observe those things he wants us to know the walk that he did and to he wants us to desire to be more like him and for us to do those things of our own free will but he does not want us to make those things what makes us acceptable to him because he's already accepted us does that make sense these are some good questions okay. I'll, I'll, uh, if you have any other thoughts about that i want you to come back and share because i want to make sure that i'm clear about that but I, I can't I can't think of the scriptures and into one of the uh, the uh, Corinthians first or, first or second Corinthians I can't remember, but they were arguing over whose baptism they received. Yep. That's and Paul true. said, "I'm glad I didn't baptize neither one of you." Right. <laughs> so that's how important baptism was to him. Right, and that's a clear indication uh -huh. of taking uh -huh. baptism of Jesus Christ uh -huh. and to make it something that it was not. That is a great indication of them trying to make it something that, because they were more concerned about who baptized them than what right. what what baptism represented in the first place. And I think God was dealing with us on that. Donnell, did you want to come back? No, uh, I'm just um, I'm just pretty much when he said uh, Corinthians, I was going through it and checking it out for him and see where it was. I'm still listening. Yeah, I no, no, you good, you good. Right. Man, He's, this, I, I'm telling you, we have a lot of fun. She is adorable. <laughs> well, her face is saltied up with crack, uh, with pretzels. <laughs> <laughs> hey, bribery, there's nothing wrong with that type of bribery. It's she had a microphone, but I couldn't let her do it because it would have been too loud. She want to sing. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So do we yeah. all kind of agree and are we on the same page about those questions? Did I answer them uh, clearly? Yes. Okay. I just want to make sure that I don't, because that's an important thing. And, and that's that's one of the things that I'm trying to, to really make sure that we're aware of, because I don't want us to get caught up in the stuff that doesn't matter. I don't want us to major in the minors. I want us to be focused on the things that are important. And trying to figure out who baptizes who is not important. Trying to figure out if if uh, oh I was supposed to be circumcised and I didn't get in, and am I damned because I didn't get circumcised? No, that's not important. That's majoring in the minors. Oops. That's made. That's, that's focusing on stuff that that does not have anything to do with what God said was the the key to His acceptance of of us. Amen. You said something else that was very important: the gift. You, I, I mean, I know some people oh, baptized many gift. times. That is a gift. Yes. Some people believe that you have to speak in tongues to have your salvation. But a gift, you have to receive. You don't have to take the gift, but it doesn't mean it takes away your salvation. That's absolutely correct. Pastor Shelby. Pastor Shelby, I wanted to make sure you got a chance to, to give your comment. Pastor Shelby, you there? Uh, yeah, somebody, somebody uh, called me, so everything kind of froze. What, what, what's going on? What was? Oh, I, th I thought you were making a comment. I just wanted to make sure we didn't miss you. I mean, you, you may have, but you know, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> well, uh, we, we, we still got a lot to go, so there's no problem. All right, so verse 15 says, and how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That is... That is why the scriptures say, how beautiful are the feet of the messengers who bring good news. So all of this that we've been talking about is really the good news of Christ. It is really the good news of what Jesus Christ did for us. And uh, it's, it's really the message that we are supposed to be preaching. It's the good news of his love, his unconditional love that we're supposed to be talking about and not all of the things that people are saying we should do in order to be accepted by him. If we really understood what, what true acceptance was, we would not be putting all of these 
precepts in place and making people jump through all of these hoops and telling them that their salvation is in the balance. I don't want to be one of those uh, teachers or pastors or preachers or whatever um, to have that on my account to say, you told all of these people that if they did not do this, they would not be accepted by me. How dare you speak for me and rewrite what I said to make it fit into your own purposes? That sounds like the Sadducees and Pharisees, what they were doing. Yeah. And you can you can be baptized. I mean, to cut you up. Uh, uh, you were eating anyway, so I may as well talk. Um, you were, um, <laughs> I'm messing with you. Um, we're talking about baptism and you know some people I've had people say they want to be baptized I mean multiple times uh -huh. you know, and you can be baptized as much as you want as many times as you want that doesn't you know that doesn't mean that you're saved you can you can go down you can you know you can go down a dry devil and come up a wet devil you know yeah. you know and I, 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 I didn't come up with that that's that just a, a phrase we say sometimes but really, you 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 go down, you go you you know you you up the dry devil, you come down, you know get wet, and you come up a wet devil. That that does that baptism does not save you, you know. Um, and and uh, some people say, well, I got saved again. I've heard some people, I got saved again. I want to get baptized again. Well, you know, baptism is, is, is symbolic. That does that is, you know just like. You wouldn't say baptism doesn't save you. Taking communion, but of course you want to be baptized because why would you do what Jesus, you know, commanded you to do? Right. Same thing with communion. If you don't take communion, that doesn't mean you're gonna to go to hell. But why wouldn't you take communion? Because it's an honor to take communion because you're you're showing forth the Lord's death until He comes. But just because you don't participate in the sacrament doesn't you know doesn't mean you're gonna to go to hell. But then again, you would think. If a person wouldn't take the sacrament, what's going on with their heart that they don't, they don't want to do it? Same thing with baptism. So baptism here's, won't, here's, if you don't get baptized, that means you're going to go to hell. But what's wrong with your heart why you wouldn't be baptized? That would be a big question I would have. And you're on the right track because my question would be is who created the sacrament? Right. Who created the sacrament? God did. Did he? Jesus just did something. He didn't create the sacrament. He said, and if you, basically he said, and if you do this, do this in remembrance of me. That's not, a, that's not establishing a doctrinal principle. That's just saying, if you do this, this shows that you are acknowledging what I did for you. That's not a, see, a sacrament is a ritual that they say that you have to do in order to show something you see what i'm saying it's it's when you call it a sacrament now you're now you're giving it value beyond what what jesus said as you learn the word and you understand what baptism is for and you understand what the word said about it then you would agree to do it because you're doing it in remembrance of him not because it's a ritual that you have to do every so often you only do it just like salvation because you believe in your heart uh, in what Jesus did for you and you want to acknowledge it. Does that make sense? So whether I do it once a month or once a day, that's on me based on how I want to relate to what God said in his word, not because of the ritualistic part of it, but because of the relational part of it that I'm saying, Lord, I'm in relationship with you. Just like washing feet. I would wash everybody's feet because Jesus did it. And I want to show the same level of respect that he showed to the people that were following him to the people that are following me. I'm not doing it because I have to do it as a ritual. I'm doing it because my father, my, my father did it. And because he did it, I want to show that same level of commitment, that same level of, 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 of respect, the same level of humility that he showed. That if you trust me to lead you, then know that I believe in you to the point where I can humble myself all the way to the point of washing your feet. Does that make sense? 
Man, it's a symbolic gesture. It's a symbolic gesture to show how much are you relating to what Jesus did. And that's on each of us to decide as we grow in our walk. It's not something that can be thrust upon us just because the word said that some people did it. If you do something without understanding it, then you're not going to get the benefit of it. And that's the key. Verse 16 says, but not everyone welcomes the good news for Isaiah the prophet said, Lord, who has believed our message? And I think this is where the shift happens and this is where he's really trying to reveal to us the purpose of what he's talking about here. Isaiah said, Lord, who has believed our message? So whether they're Gentiles, whether they're Jews, to whatever level of belief they are, he's asking the question, who believes our message? I'm pretty sure we can go into several churches and say, I wonder who believes in the message of Christ. I wonder who really believes in what he said. I wonder who really believes that they are truly saved and that they don't have to do anything else, but just to continue to develop their relationship for the purpose of, um, acknowledging him in a greater way. I wonder who believes our message of the good news, believes that they're saved, believe that Jesus died for their sins, believe that, that they don't have, have to live by the law. I wonder who believes our message. Verse 17 says, so faith comes from hearing, and that is hearing uh, the good news about Christ. But I ask, have the people of Israel actually heard the message? Yes, they have. The message has gone throughout the earth and the words to all the world. And this applies to us today. How many televangelists, how many uh, radio shows, how many pastors, preachers, evangelists, apostles are out there all over the world talking about the good news of Christ? People... It is to the point where we have to do movies that say God is not dead. You know what I'm saying? To, to get people to, to wake up and realize that he's not dead. People know about God, but they purposely don't receive him. And they take, take up positions to try to defend what they believe and how they, how they believe about what's going on to the point of questioning what's real and what's not real. And that, that creates the doubt in them, and then it causes them to want to debate with us. That's why I believe that God simply guided us by saying we're not supposed to debate his word. That's why I believe he told me, it's not my job to convince you that the word is true. It's just my job to tell you what the truth is and let you decide for yourself. It's not my job to convince, but my job to convey. Anybody want to want to uh, comment on on this particular scripture uh, talking about who has heard our message uh, and that the message has truly already gone out. I'm pretty sure there are people that you work with that if they find out you're a Christian, they'll know enough about the word and enough about Jesus Christ of what they're rejecting to question you about your behavior. <laughs> you do things and what you're doing. Would you agree? It's a lot. It's a lot of people. The message is going forth. This is the truth. But it's gone forth and it's been corrupted so much that it allows people to have doubt. And we have to tell the truth so that people can see the truth. We have to take out all of these other things that continue to be put into the mix so that people can clearly see what the word says and decide about that. One of the wow. things that... Go ahead. No, go ahead. One, one of the things so many people are hung up on is how many times the the Bible has been translated, and what's what's the correct translation. So they they get hung up on that a lot. How do you know you have the truth? Yeah, you know? because I learned how to see the principles behind the word and not get caught up on every word that's printed on the page. And I just tell people that you know it bears witness with me, you know, and you know some some things you just can't prove. You know, some things are some things are just a witness in your life, and and there's a whole field of study called apologetics, 
And so, you know, there, there are a trillion books out there about uh, Christian apologetics and apologetics is just meaning being able to uh, give a defense for what you believe in. Mm -hmm. And, you know, of course you want to be able to intelligently defend your faith. You know, I mean, you can say, like, I, I have people come, you know, so someone may say, um, maybe ask me, hey, uh, and I'm just an example. Mm -hmm. um, shall we just tell me, is, is, is uh, Jesus God or is, just, or is Jesus God's son? Which one? Now, they saying that because they may be a Mormon or whatever. And, you know, but we should be able to give a defense of why we believe what we believe not that we're trying to argue somebody down or anything or but you you have to be able to take a rational approach to it so why is it that you aren't a jehovah witness uh, or why now i think it's incumbent upon us to respect other people's religion enough to study their religion so that you can at least see many times like i have a jehovah witness friend or whatever now if I, I could preach to them and say, oh, man, why don't you celebrate your birthday or whatever? whatever. But the thing is, if I don't even care enough to learn what he believes, then, you know, I'm just winning an argument. And that, that, doesn't, that doesn't change anybody's heart. But I try to, you know, respect other people's, you know, religion beliefs, you know, enough to, to learn about it, you know. And then, you know, the field of apologetics is just learning how to give a defense to your faith. And as far as one of the uh, one of the things that people who are agnostics or uh, who may not be Christians, one of the knocks that they say is that well, yeah, the Bible been translated so many times. How do, how do you know you're getting the right right one? There are a trillion books even just written about that about the historicity right. of the of the the Bible, the Old Testament, New Testament. So you ain't the first one to ask it, but but. Just look up the field of apologetics, and that's all about that. Being able to give a rational, reasonable, you know, defense for your faith. Ultimately, it's going to be take the Holy Spirit to convince people, but we should be able to be intelligent about the answers that we get. And I, I think that you, I, I'm glad you use the terminology that you use because words are important. And here's where, here's where I would challenge you. The field of apologetics is designed to to create you give you the ability to create a defense for what you believe, correct? Right. To right. give a reason right. for, for hope so that's you, in you. So yeah. so it so let me translate that for you. In reality, what it's supposed to be, and that would align with God. To be able to support why you believe what you believe not defend because if i'm defending myself i'm defending myself in a fight but if i'm supporting what i believe then what i'm doing is giving a rational reasonable justification for what i believe with facts to back it up which is really what apologetics is but words are important see we get tripped up by the words that we use because if you tell me i need to defend myself typically that means that there is a fight right and I got to get prepared to fight. But we're not supposed to have that mentality when it comes to the word of God. We're not supposed to argue, which if I'm defending what I believe, it is typically going to be because somebody is coming at me aggressively trying to convince me of what it is that they believe over what I believe. But see, God says nothing changes but by love. So if I take the position of supporting what I believe without trying to get you to 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 change your thought process now i planted a seed that can grow and you have to struggle against yourself to tell whether or not it's true you don't have to struggle against me you have to struggle against yourself because what i did was i gave you support for what why i believe what i believe and i'm just not going to be tricked into getting into these useless senseless conversations like Terry said that that can't be proven and you know it can't be proven because they give you though when when you are an agnostic or when you are uh someone who's not a believer and you study they tell you the questions to ask christians that's gonna trip them up right and so understanding what it is that you're trying to do 
as a as a goal so you're trying to discredit my belief by challenging what i believe and if i get pulled into that trap then other people that are a witness to that can see whether or not or how well i can defend what it is that i'm supposed to believe or not because i'm fighting on your terms i'm i'm i'm, I'm now in your arena when my job is to encourage support and uplift i don't have to prove to you and i'll tell you that I'll say, you know what, that's a great question. There are many questions in the Bible that don't have an answer, but I have an answer for you, and I'll share why I believe what I believe. Doesn't mean that you have to change what you believe, but I'll tell you why I believe what I believe, and then I'll make my statement. And then after it's over with, I'll say, now, believe what you want, look it up, study it, check it out for yourself, but you don't have to believe it because I said it, but I believe it to be true, and it's helped me out in my life and leave it at that you know what i'm saying there's no fight if they come back and try to throw a whole bunch of other stuff at me i'm gonna say well i've simply shared with you why i believe what i believe whether you agree with it or not it's up to you and and you know and and i think you can try a person's spirit because you know some people want some people just like to 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 argue for argument's sake some people just want to debate just you know and they made up their mind you know about their position already but then but then there are some people who are seekers and and then you know i just think it, it is incumbent upon us to 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 never be lazy intellectually uh so that we are able to you know, to, to to rightly divide the word of truth because the thing it's important to be able to rightly divide because if there is such a thing as rightly dividing then that must be a wrongly dividing <laughs> you know what i mean and so we want to rightly divide the word of truth and i just think you know so study is important um you know you don't make a god out of your reason you know reasoning but yet you never want to get lazy and feel like well hey you know i just know that i know that i know that i know you know that i love the lord and that's fine but many times we have to be able to be more sophisticated depending on the arena that you're in you yep. know depending on you know if you're talking to a doctor or a lawyer or whatever sometimes i mean i can still say i know that i know that i know that's fine but many times it's good to be able to say okay i i you know i i've read you know the the argument of you know the, uh, the ontological argument i've read these you know not not to be prideful but just to be able to say hey i'm i've done lord i've done what i can do to to be uh um, um to, to show myself approved a workman that need, need might not be ashamed you know absolutely i mean there, there are some people some people are almost down you know you don't got to go to college you don't got to go to bible college you know well you don't you, you know nobody should be you know down a person for getting you know a master's degree or you know biblical apologetics and all that do that you know ultimately it's going to be the holy spirit anyway but yet you know it's a good thing to do all you can to learn as much as you can about the lord and and his way and, and rightly divide the word of truth i think i think another way that uh well one way that we can prove the word of god is real uh one scripture i like to use second peter 2 19 where it says we That's have it. a more we have a more sure word written of the prophets and you do well if you pay attention it's like a light being turned on in a dark place so i mean when you study prophecy and you see these things that have been fulfilled that are being fulfilled and things that are falling into place you can't deny that the word of god is not true i mean you can be ignorant or you can be willfully ignorant it's a, it's a choice so when i see when I study prophecies that have been written thousands of years ago and I see them coming into order today, then I have to trust and believe that this is divine. This is divine word of God. That's wisdom. Mm -hmm. That's wisdom. But once again, that's sharing a truth that can prove itself out. I don't have to. Exactly. Exactly. And I think we need to be more skillful, even more skillful than people who study apologetics because i think there's a higher level to go to when it comes to sharing the truth about the word of god people are looking for a fight 
and they're expecting Christians to come and be aggressive. And so that's why they come at us aggressively. Mm-hmm. You know, if you don't, if you don't meet their aggression with aggression, if you meet their aggression with love, mm-hmm. then there is no opportunity for conflict. And what you do is open up the opportunity for them to receive what you're saying and to have respect for you because of how you went about saying what you said. That's big. That's big. That's big. Sometimes that, you let your yay be yay and your nay be nay. <laughs> exactly. So, but, 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 but as you said, you know, even you have to know the truth, of course, and the truth will make you free. But you speak, the Bible says, speak the truth in love. So okay. even if you're saying the right thing, if you're saying it in the wrong spirit, uh-uh, I don't want to hear it, you know. You know? So, and and, and uh, see, you always throw these great alley-oops. Yeah. Uh, what you just said made the point. Well, so apologetics as a discipline contradicts speaking the truth in love. You see what I'm saying? And that's where we have to be careful. We have to be careful that everything that we're doing aligns with the word. So what God is trying to do can be made clear. There's a lot of great ideas out there, but sometimes we do them the wrong way. (laughs) Verse 19 says, but I ask, did the people of Israel really understand? Yes, they did. For even in the time of Moses, God said, I will rouse your jealousy through people who are not even a nation. I will provoke your anger through the foolish Gentiles. (laughs) (laughs) He said, I love Paul. He said, okay, God is going to show you what's going on. Hold on. My my, uh, computer don't want to move forward. Why are you taking so long? I'm about to go to my backup. Well, you underline the question. Uh, Is that yeah. we get that for us to address it? Uh, so I was I was actually playing around. I did want to highlight that question, but I I was really playing around to make sure that y'all could see it at the same time. But <laughs> did the people of Israel really understand? Go ahead, jump in. <laughs> Help me out. Well, you know, when you talk about different translations, and let's just be real, none of us really speak Hebrew. Uh Uh, So in order to translate English, Spanish, Italian, some of the words meaning is different. So you have to exhaust using your strongs (laughs) to exhaust the word to get a greater understanding what certain words mean. So to which translate word you like, Bible, which word would you like to know? Because I got it right here. You know I do. <laughs> but you know, um, even the word faith, you know, people even use that famous um example, you have faith in the chair that is gonna hold you. So why wouldn't you have faith in God who holds you? Right. Um, you trust in that, why can't you trust God? You trust in something that man put together. But God created man, so why wouldn't you trust him? He put us all together. Mm-hmm. So sometimes you have to go and translate, understand a word or two to get the understanding, to understand if the people did really understand what you mm-hmm. said. Well, let me, let me go back to that scripture in the King James Version. All right. In the King James Version, it says, but I say, did not Israel know? Hmm? Did, not, did not Israel know? So he didn't say, did they understand? He said, did they, did Israel know? And the word know is translated from, it's translated from, I won't say, uh, uh, it's genus, so, uh, <clears throat> gnosis. Gnosis, yeah. Uh, which is a prolonged form of a primary verb to know or absolutely. So he's really saying, 
he's really posing the question as a statement to say that they did know or indicate or imply that they did know by saying, did not Israel know? Right. So he was really, he was really indicating that they did know as, as, uh, as a, as a thought process. And, and it was translated in this verse, uh, did the people of Israel really understand? But no, Paul was saying, no, they were aware. They knew. Didn't they know? They didn't they know? They did know, didn't they? That's basically what he's saying. So it is a far gone conclusion that they, they knew but did not accept. It says, first Moses said, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by the foolish nation, I will anger you. And so what he's saying was the people of Israel at the time was not accepting uh, even what God was showing them. And because of that, he said, well, because you won't accept what God said, I'm going to use people who are non-believers, who are non-chosen to prove my point. And that's what really what was going on. He was using other people to prove his point because of what they did not or would not accept or believe. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, let me see. Okay. And later Isaiah spoke boldly for God saying, I was found by people who were not looking for me. I showed myself to those who were not asking for me. So this is when Jesus was going around from place to place. He's indicating, he said, I was found by people who were not looking for me. I showed myself to those who were not asking for me. And those people were the ones who believed. Those were the ones who, when he provided, but when he showed uh, his miracles, those are the ones that accepted him and received him. Verse 21 says, if I can get it to pull up, Jesus. So this is the last scripture for today. I don't know why my computer is. I need a new computer, y'all. <laughs> I'm working on it, too. We'll talk about a little bit of that in just a second. Let's see. Come on. I just need you to show the last scripture. One more scripture. Just one more. Well, I'll read it to you. Uh, let me switch translations to make to be consistent. In the New Living Translation, uh, verse 21 says, but regarding Israel, God said, all day long, I openly, uh, I opened my arms to them, but they were disobedient and rebellious. So at the end of this chapter, God ends with, and later Isaiah spoke boldly for God, saying, I was found by the people who were not looking for me. I showed myself to those who were not asking for me. But regarding Israel, God said, all day long, I opened my arms to them, but they were disobedient and rebellious. And it, on that, that says that everything that God has showed the children of Israel, everything that he wanted for them, they were rebellious to it. And so what they suffered was a direct, uh, was in direct proportion to what they were not willing to receive from him. And that's the struggle that we have today. Even those of us who, have confessed Jesus Christ as Lord, who go to church every day, who, who knows that God is real. There's a difference between knowing God is real and believing in him. And he tried to indicate to that, uh, indicate that to us in the scriptures as well. And so I would say that uh, one of my takeaways from today is that he was showing us that we are like the children. We're like the Jews. We're like the chosen ones. We're like the children of Israel. And in some ways, we can slip up into a position where we take for granted what God has done for us. And we fall into these ideas that mean that we have to prove something to God in order to be worthy, in order to be accepted, in order to be saved. He's trying to get us to understand that's not the case. And he gives us a case study in the scripture to show what the children of Israel did and how they continued to prove that they didn't truly believe, even though they were favored, even though God bent over backwards for them, they still didn't believe what they saw. Not only did they not have faith, but they didn't even believe what they saw and, and, and categorized it for, 
for being real. That's why they suffer for 40 years in the uh, in the jungle, uh, in the wilderness, um, because when they were going into the promise, uh, were, were supposed to go into the promised land, they didn't believe. They didn't follow the principles and the, and the things that God had put in place for them in order for them to receive what God said they were supposed to receive. 